Coming up on Pet Heroes, two seasoned mountain horses work together to free a young thoroughbred from a deadly bog. And fast rising floodwaters threaten a yellow lab and her vulnerable puppies. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. When mature animals face a crisis, they rely on their instincts to survive. But what happens with younger animals who don't yet have the ability to recognize danger? Well, here are two inspiring stories of experienced animals taking extreme action when the survival of their species is threatened. The Yaha Tinder Ranch is nestled in the foothills of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Richard Smith is the ranch foreman out here. The Yaha Tinda first and always is a horse training facility for Parks Canada. All the horses train for the warden's services in the Banff National Parks and all of the mountain parks are trained here and then go are assigned to different parks from here. There's also um, a lot of teaching goes on out here as the new wardens come in and are starting to go into the field for the first times. They'll come here and we'll help them with their horse experience, get them started, starting them packing teaching them how to cross rivers and get along in the mountains without getting themselves hurt, hopefully. Today, Richard has two very special visitors, Dale Portman and Kathy Calvert, retired park wardens who have long histories with the Yaha Tinder Ranch. Now a published author, Dale spends his time writing about his adventures in the park warden's service back when he was just a young man. I'm compiling you know, all these stories and try and get published another book on my early times, early days in Banff and Jasper National Park. Kathy, also an author, has the distinction of being one of Canada's first female park wardens and has worked on ranches much of her life. I'd grown up with a twin brother and my father treated us both equally, so I grew up hunting and fishing and, and we had a farm and I had some horse skills that, that I developed as a, as a child. Dale and Kathy first met in the summer of 1975 while stationed at Yoho National Park in British Columbia. While Dale had already served a few seasons, it was Kathy's first job as a park warden in a male-dominated environment. For the first uh, two weeks that I was hired, uh, nobody wanted me to do anything. I was sort of hanging around. <laughs> and finally I said, well, I really need to start doing some work here. It's not long before Kathy finally has a chance to prove herself to the men she works alongside. Dale has been looking for an opportunity to gauge her horse handling skills, a vital part of the warden's service. He asks her to join him for a casual ride down to some flats near the Kicking Horse River. I was looking at taking a horse by the name of Lane, who was a four-year-old, kind of a colt, and putting some miles on him. And I thought there would be a good opportunity to take Kathy along and just assess what her uh, riding skills were and her backcountry skills were. Lane was a gangly kind of thoroughbred type horse that was, I guess, uh, skittish, high strung. When you're riding him, you had to pay attention all the time because he could shy, you know, he could bolt, you know, he could start bucking. While Dale struggles with Lane, Kathy easily saddles up Red, an older, more experienced horse. He was a beautiful horse, very solid, very quiet, but huge heart. One of the horses that uh, if you are at all uneasy about your skills, he's a great horse. He's going to make you look good and a wonderful personality. I just loved him. <laughs> just about ready? Yeah, I'm coming. As they set out, Lane starts to relax, so Dale decides to steer him toward more challenging terrain. It seemed like a good idea at the time. We uh, rode farther west along uh, the Kicking Horse River until the confluence of the Otter Tail and the Kicking Horse. This was going to present new country, uh, lots of bush and uh, logs, this sort of thing. So, so Lane was going to be exposed to, to a lot of new things. As we rode along, we came upon a, an opening, a big, not a big meadow, but a, a relatively average size meadow that you'd find in a pocket of timber. And uh, I rode out into the middle of it, and it looked dry and cracked. And Lane took a look at it, sniffed it, was standing on, on the edge, and then all of a sudden it kind of started to sink on him. His front legs went down. And because he was inexperienced, he panicked. The horse panicked, basically, and started lunging into the, into the swamp. 
I realized that we were in really a lot of trouble because it was a bog and uh, and Lane was floundering and starting to go down and uh, I bailed off of him right away because I wanted to be able to get him around and uh, and I didn't want to have my weight on him. Fortunately for me, I wasn't sinking as much and he struggled and struggled and finally he was exhausted. Red was smart enough. He wasn't going to go anywhere near the, near the swamp. I don't recall what Dale said at the time, something to the effect of, give me a hand here. So I tied the horse up and, um, and waited out and realized that this is quite deep. In fact, by the time I got out to the horse, I, I was basically up to my waist. And now it was getting really serious because uh, he was now over on his side and he was in danger of his head laying in the, in the water. And of course, with the heavy breathing that was going on with him, his nostrils were flared and, and, and we just had to make sure that his head didn't go into the water. So Kathy basically cradled Lane's head and, and held him there while I tried to, you know, force him to get back up and get his feet from underneath him. And it just wasn't working out. Nothing they try is able to budge the horse. Time to change tactics. So we thought, well, if we can get some logs underneath him, you know, try and pry him up, we could, you know, tip him upright and get his feet underneath him. So uh, Dale went and got uh, as many logs as he could find. I think we must have worked at him for about half an hour, and the horse was getting exhausted. It just wasn't going to happen. So at that point, Dale said, OK, well, I've got to go get help. So we went back to shore and got on the radio and called uh, into the office. Luckily, Randy Robertson, the only other warden on duty, happens to be near the radio. I told him that of the situation that we were in and, and that if he could pick up a couple horses and, uh, and head up uh, towards Otter Tail, and I would meet him at the road. And then at the last minute he said, and get a gun too. <laughs> and I was going, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is rather serious. This is quite serious. As Randy swings into action formulating a rescue plan, Dale explains to Kathy she'll have to be on her own for a while looking after Lane. He had to ride out to the highway because this is obscure. This is, you know, just the middle of a bush. Nobody could have found us. Kathy toughs it out in the bog with Lane, but time is running out for the young horse. A colt lies mired in a remote wilderness bog, and warden Kathy Calvert tries to keep it from thrashing and sinking even further. Meanwhile, fellow warden Dale Portman rides off to either round up a rescue or a rifle. So I was basically just trying to soothe the horse and largely thinking, OK, I hope they can find us. It seemed to me they were gone about an hour, and that's, that's long enough. But in those conditions, you know, time seems to take forever. Finally, Dale and Red return with Warden Randy Robertson and another horse, Elva. Well, Elva was a good mountain pony. She's a little more excitable than Red, but uh, otherwise, pretty steady horse. When Randy got there, I think that he looked at the situation and, and just the look on his face, you know, could tell you that it didn't look very good. We got Red and Elva together. We got them lined up at the edge, uh, side by side, and we took the ropes and ran one back to uh, Lane's saddle. The other one we, we laid back and, and attached to, uh, to his rump. I was going to you know, slap Lane in the flanks and try and get him going and, and, and see if he could get his feet underneath him again. And uh, while Randy would look after the two horses, Red and Elva, that we're going to be pulling. It's up to Elva and Red now as the team prepares to save Lane. The horses can sense one of their own is in danger, and they assume the same sense of mission as the three wardens. John Garner is responsible for the safe handling of the world's top show jumping horses at Spruce Meadows, one of the most impressive equestrian facilities on the planet. Well, the danger was clearly life-threatening. If he's not gotten out of there, Lane is dying, uh, pure and simple. Horses survive uh, by moving around. They're an animal that's designed to eat and move 20 some hours a day. If a horse is stationary for too long, and we're talking hours, um, they'll plug up, everything will just stop moving. If a horse moves on to its side, which is a situation Lane had found himself in, all the fluids will then also go onto that side of the horse's body, and, and in fact, they can drown. Both horses and humans work desperately to free Lane from the bog. There's no question that Alva and Red knew that Lane was in danger. Undeniably, they would have been aware of the situation. 
they heaved. You know, then they got the horses to really pull. I remember Elva looked back at, at Lane, and I think Red did too, and they just said, you know, we're it. <laughs> you know, we've got to get this horse out of here. And, and they, they had, it was like they had a, a lot of empathy for, for Lane, you know, in the swamp. Despite their efforts, Lane remains mired in the mud. Dale and Randy move Elva and Red into a new position, hoping it will give Lane a better chance at escaping the bog. So we realigned it a bit more, and uh, we tried it again, and, and Elva was, was really, re she foundered at one point, you know. And she just really threw herself into it. And, oh, God, we're going to hurt another horse. <laughs> more time passes, and still no progress. Spirits are low. And we had to stop everything and, uh, and let everybody rest. And uh, I mean, it's, it, it was really difficult. Kathy was shivering because she's sitting in this mud and water and holding Lane's head up. So, you know, we were con I was concerned about her. Lane is fading. So is the strength of the rescuers. If there's no breakthrough soon, the only solution might be the rifle. We realigned everything, uh, got the horses in a different angle. And, and now Lane was pretty well, you know, in line with the, with the two horses. The horses know it's now up to them. Red kind of nuzzled Elva on the neck, you know, kind of saying, like, this is really serious, you know. Let's, let's just give it everything we got. I mean, it was just like they were communicating to each other. Okay, Red, let's go, buddy. You got to pull him out of there. Come on, Elva. You could see him finally coming back and getting his feet underneath him. Red and Elva were pulling pretty hard and, and were making progress, starting to move up, you know, away from the water's edge. And Randy was leading them. And Lane just bolted up, broke the bond, and, and, and started jumping forward and, uh, and then finally got onto shore. Finally, after hours of futile struggle, Lane breaks free. I don't think we give animals enough credit for uh, as much intelligence and communication as, as they have and a lot of people don't realize it, they don't see it. It's very subtle, it's, it's a different language. It was one of those things where, well, I can't believe we'd managed to do this, but it did happen, and thankfully for Red and Elva, you know, teaming up together and doing what they did, uh, you know, it saved the day. Dale's most recent collection of short stories includes one called Stuck in the Muck. My horse, Annabelle, and I were on the right course, but were some distance behind. The mare reached out, stretching, covering as much ground as possible with each stride. The valiant effort of Elva and Red that saved him. I mean, you know, we helped out, but it was Elva and Red that did it, you know. We wouldn't have been able to do it any other way. It would have meant the bullet, you know, and, that's, and that was a sad reality that we we're kind of facing. Red just had a lot of heart, and so did Elva. If it hadn't been for those two horses, we would not have got him out of there. They know about bog. They know how deadly it is for them. And, uh... Yeah, Red just really put his heart into it. And I think he encouraged Elva. So I think they're, they were definitely saving, saving Lane. Though Kathy and Dale didn't realize it at the time, that fateful day over 35 years ago was one of their first dates. Their relationship grew, and they were eventually married. Next on Pet Heroes. Can this quick-thinking yellow lab find safety for her pups when floodwaters invade their home? We just saw how two veteran trail horses summoned incredible strength and resolve to save a colt who wandered into a deadly bog. Next, we meet a Labrador retriever who uses surprising ingenuity when the forces of nature threaten the lives of her pups. Fernando and Christine Cunha are lifelong dog lovers who live and work in Chatham, Ontario. Both of them employed in youth services. Their daughter Jacqueline keeps busy with dance classes and soccer when she's not hanging out with her friends or her cousin Bailey. The two dogs in their life are Muggsy, an American Bull Mastiff who they picked up less than a year ago, and Maggie, a yellow lab who's been with them nine years. She's a very um, friendly dog, very caring. Um, she loves to play, and she's always there waiting on the, the front porch every day when I pull in. As soon as someone comes in, she acknowledges that someone's here, which is a bonus for us. Uh, like I said, it's our own little, uh, I don't know, 
alarm system, I guess. Whenever we go to bed, she kind of just lays right in the same room with us. It just hangs out with us. Uh, very attached to humans is basically the way it is. Maggie wasn't always so warm toward people. Fernando learned through a friend of a dog in need of a new home. But when he went to check her out, she was the opposite of outgoing. All in all, Maggie's situation with her previous owners was not good. I ended up finding out the dog was abused. Uh, it was malnourished. It was, it just, it was, it was a very timid dog. They basically said if I didn't take the dog that they're going to put it down, so I took the dog. Very timid, didn't want to get in a vehicle or anything. Once she's in the vehicle, she's very shy, very into the corner. Um, she would kind of cower down um, when you went to pet her. Um, she was fearful. She wouldn't come out of her doghouse um, for the first little while. She wouldn't come in the house. She would shake. The family was patient with Maggie, but she wouldn't leave the safety of the doghouse. Each day, I think, like, we would go out and try to talk to her, pet her, make her feel kind of comfortable, and then eventually she just came out. So I think it was just a trial and error basis for the dogs attempting to come out, realizing that we weren't going to injure it, and slowly coming out, until, honestly, she just started, to, the minute she got out and started latching on to us, that was it. Very minimal training with the dog after that. Um, it was, it was kind of odd, because I, I would teach the trick, and she'd pick it up in two seconds, literally. Maggie does not require a leash. I mean, we live on a paved road that's kind of a, a lot of fast-moving vehicles, but Maggie knows kind of the boundaries of our home and, and on our property line, and she will remain in that um, area at all times. Maggie went from being a timid abuse victim to a loving family pet. Then, in 2005, she became a hero. That's the year she gave birth to 13 puppies, of which 12 survived. She was an enthusiastic mother and, like all mothers, was protective of her young. When the pups were only a month old, Maggie's protective instincts were put to the ultimate test. It starts when the weatherman calls for rain, extremely heavy rain. It was a muggy day. It was starting to, starting to overcast. Work started at 6 o'clock in the morning. They were already mentioning about uh, thunderstorms coming in on a radio, so we were getting pretty much prepared for it. Um, by making sure, you know, that our stuff were in place, I made sure my stuff pump was working, that type of stuff. When the rain finally comes, it falls so hard that Fernando comes home on his lunch break to check if everything is still okay. The puppies were good, uh, the sub pumps were working, I can hear them going off, so I had no concerns in regards to what was going on. The battery backup has a light on that, I also made sure it was, it was functional. Um, so I went back to work. The storm grows even more intense. With no one but Maggie and her pups in the house, disaster strikes. Was we had so much water in such a short period of time that my one pump blew out. It just blew up completely because of the amount uh, of usage it was going on. The other one was rusted. My battery backup we couldn't, wasn't strong enough to keep up with the water. The basement begins flooding. Maggie and her puppies are trapped. Veterinarian Wendy McClellan shares her perspective. Mammals innately want to protect their young, um, essentially to propagate the species. Maggie was clearly very intelligent. She knew that water is a danger. Water is a danger to all mammals because we can't breathe underwater. The, she would have known her babies would be in danger with the water. Desperation kicks in, and Maggie goes to work. She spots some blankets and begins piling them on the floor against the wall. Some of the blankets were blankets that uh, we had there that the puppies were laying on. And other blankets were for my daughter that she would use for her dolls. In an extraordinary effort to save her offspring, Maggie builds an island of blankets. One by one, she starts moving her puppies onto it until all 12 are safe. But to think to build, build it up so she made an island, I mean, that's, that's fascinating and shows, shows her innovation and shows her intelligence. But Maggie's heroics may come to nothing. The water keeps rising. Soon, the island she built will be underwater. As work was done, I was finished at about 4 o'clock, 4.30. We went outside, and there was trees that were on the ground. Um, there was cars that had branches on them. At this point, I started getting concerned. As the water continues to rise, Maggie's island begins to float and break apart. Her last hope is to become part of the island herself. I got home, I opened the door, and I hear Maggie crying. So at this point, I walked downstairs. As soon as I looked down the stairs, I seen that there was water in my basement. That's when I started to panic a little bit. To this day, Fernando is still amazed at the scene he found in his basement. Basically, what she did is this. She dropped the blankets like this is what it looked like. And looking at that, she grabbed all the puppies and placed them on top of the, the blankets. And then she curdled the blanket like this. So when I walked in, she was banked like this, just nudging the, the puppies. And they're all wet in this area here. 
is basically how it happened. So I don't know if she really realized that pushing it against the wall just made another barrier. Um, if it was instinct or for just it just the way it happened, but this is what how it looked. So I picked up every puppy I started putting on top of the bar, you know, because I seen the dog and, and very anxious, you know, was panicking. I just grabbed them all, thinking I was thinking there was a bunch of them dead. I honestly thought I was gonna pick up a couple and they were just gonna be limp. In my practice, I do hear stories of dogs saving their saving their babies, but I think Maggie really sticks out. To save all 12 puppies is just so remarkable. By the time Christine gets home, Fernando has moved the puppies and is drying them off. Maggie does her part as well. Maggie was very loving. She just licked the puppies because, you know, obviously they were wet. I think that the puppies knew that Maggie was their mother and that Maggie would go to no end to protect them, to keep them safe, um, to keep them warm, and to uh, just to care for them. I mean, to this day, she's still a hero. Every day, I mean, it, we, we still live in the same house, still have the same area, so it's pretty hard not to walk by that and not think, hey, look what happened here. Yeah, she's definitely a hero, in our eyes, for sure. She changed somewhat when the puppies, when we started giving the puppies away. She, she became very, very attached to these puppies, so when we were slowly started giving them away, a lot of anxiety kicked in. And after that, uh, no, it went right back to normal. Everything was good again. It's a proud feeling to own such a dog, a dog like, you know, Maggie, um, who, you know, basically put herself out there. You know, she, she did what she had to do um, as a mother to save her pups. And, you know, it makes me proud because I think as a mother myself, I would want to react the same way. And for to have my dog do that, it's just great. It's wonderful. When Maggie saw that her puppies were on the verge of drowning, her maternal instincts kicked in and she found a clever way to shield her young. Elva and Red, on the other hand, used brute strength and cooperation to rescue Lane when he became trapped in a dangerous bog. In both cases, we're reminded of the heroic lengths our animals will go to to protect their most vulnerable. For more information, visit cmt.ca slash pet heroes.